Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the generous introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I know this is not my first time here, and I know, as everybody in Europe does know, the importance, the degree of uh, uh, wide-ranging activities, and above all, the influential nature of this institute. That's why I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon. Um, yes, I will make a few remarks on the future of the most ancient component of European integration, which is the single market, after all. Um, so, the, with the idea of uh, recording now, but presenting the podcast next week, it will be possible to check uh, whether what I will be presenting to President Barroso on Monday is the authentic version or not. <laughs> um, the... In, in 2005, in his report on the Lisbon strategy towards greater competitiveness for Europe, former Dutch Prime Minister Wim Kok wrote, among other things, this sentence on the single market. I repeat, 2005. I quote, the internal market program is felt to be yesterday's business and does not receive the priority it should. This is a fatal policy error. That was five years ago. By the way, you will hear me speak of single market, not of internal market. The, the legal terminology in the treaty is indeed internal market. But uh, since the day I, I was commissioner for internal market, I was convinced that uh, if we talk to ordinary citizens in any of our countries and we talk of the internal market, they legitimately may believe that we are talking of their own domestic national market, number one. Number two, if on the other hand we talk about the European internal market using that expression in uh, Washington or Tokyo or Beijing, they will see in that internal evidence of what they believe is the truth and we know is not the truth, namely of a rather closed European market, a fortress Europe. So because we are not, why should we project uh, that image? And also, to me, single conveys a, uh, a signal of uh, will, because it is a hard work to create and then to, to maintain a single market, because that is the element of integration, whereas in whatever conditions, there will always be in Europe an internal market, which is a more neutral term. So I've almost concluded my 20 minutes. <laughs> um, now, um, I, um, what, what I've done for President Barroso uh, on the basis of his an <coughs> announced strong political determination to um, make of the single market again a strategic objective, I've developed the analogies and the differences between uh, uh, a possible project for the single market today and uh, the situation exactly 25 years ago when Jacques Delors, at the beginning of his first commission, uh, developed the white paper on the internal market, on the single market, which was then adopted by the European Council of June 1985, allow me to add, in Milan. The, uh, the, uh, relative to um, then, the situation of the, uh, of the single market is, in my, in my view, much more concerning today. 
because uh, uh, after that sentence of Wimcock in 2005, when he said that it was considered a business of the past, we have seen a growing uneasiness, anxiety and rejection across many European countries on the single market. And this is something I will insist upon a bit, because uh, when uh, um, discussing these topics uh, in the UK, and I believe to some extent this might be the case here as well, there is not, in my view, an adequate perception of the extent to which other people in Europe have concerns about the single market. Um, and uh, over the last five months, as I consulted with, uh, with all member states, uh, with uh, all groups in the European Parliament, with the stakeholders, etc. And I've come up with uh, a sort of a mapping of the concerns. Uh, already before the crisis, we had uh, growing concerns about uh, what we can call an integration fatigue. Take the very difficult process uh, of legislation and the very poor final outcome in the area of the takeover directive. Take the saga about the services directive and the role that the Polish plumber plays, uh, played uh, in the French referendum of 2005. Those were signals of integration fatigue. I mean, French voters nominally were asked to pronounce on the Rome II Treaty of 2003 on the Constitutional Treaty, but in fact they voted down the Rome I Treaty of 1957, which contained freedom of movements with which they felt uneasy in a widened community. After the Integration fatigue came the market fatigue. Let's be frank, the crisis of the last couple of years has not increased the image of the market economy in Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, with the crisis, uh, and for the next several years, I believe, those whose role it is to push ahead the market construction in Europe and to make it competitive will have a harder life. It, it was never easy to begin with, but it will be much more difficult because the burden of the proof will now be on those who want to have more market, more openness and more competition in Europe because the psychological climate in many countries has changed. And uh, I think we can expect that to be the case for many more uh, years. And uh, with that has also come, uh, I'm afraid, a, a substantial, I hope, temporary loss of influence by the Anglo-Saxon countries in continuing the European construction. Um, after all, the engines of the single market of economic integration in Europe had been Germany and France, of course, with the strong support of Italy and the Benelux countries, uh, in the 50s with the Treaty of Rome, then because of reunification, because of cultural complexities in France, uh, this duo lost a bit of steam in the 90s in terms of pushing forward market integration and they became more introverted and uh, uh, refraining on that line. But the UK, and can I say because of its very important uh, role also as a showcase of success, Ireland. And I'm sure that will be the case again soon. Uh, but certainly with the, the crisis, the uh, um, degree of influence of this model uh, or these models, we should never oversimplify uh, on the European continent, is a bit reduced. And by the way, if we look for engines, as I do in my report to Mr. Barroso, engines for a possible new drive of the single market, we have to turn to the new member states. They have an appetite for growth relative to the social, which is understandable at that early stage of economic development. 
uh, they like uh, um, a strong enforcement of the single market uh, through the community method by the Commission, by the European Court of Justice, something that France and Germany have come to dislike a bit in recent years. But obviously, if you are a small, new, somewhat unexperienced and less rich member state, you feel nicely protected by an arbiter whose role it is to enforce the rules for the large and for the small, for the rich and for the less rich. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, I believe that uh, those of us in Europe who care about uh, the market uh, economy and integration uh, should have a hope uh, coming from Central and Eastern Europe, and at this time, particularly from, from uh, Poland, given also their pretty good economic performance. I was in Poland during my consultations for this work, and it came natural to, to tell the, the government and also at an audience uh, like, like today here, uh, uh, unfortunately, you will never be able to be founding members of the European Union because you were not there at the beginning. But you can, particularly you, the Poles, next year when you have the rotating presidents in 2012, second half, you can become a re-founding member of the European Union with your fervor for the market. Uh, you can, uh, for once, exercise your well-known assertiveness, not on a national issue or a regional issue like uh, Ukraine or energy security or the relationship with Russia, but on an issue which, by definition, is of, of interest of the 27. Hence, do that, and I hope they will. Now, uh, I spent a lot of time outlining these uh, concerns, and uh, uh, those concerns can also be mapped not only over time, but also by stakeholders and, and, and actors, uh, business concerns, uh, social concerns, uh, consumer concerns, etc., 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 and by, this is most interesting, I think, politically, by groups of member states, and you already noticed implicitly that I refer to a vision of the single market increasingly skeptical, which characterizes continental social market economies, a vision which has been very supportive, although now a bit less effective in advocacy from the Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, a demand for that by the new member states. And my political proposal to the President of the European Commission is to try and work towards a new pact on the single market. We cannot proceed to strengthening the single market for the next uh, 5 to 20 years unless we openly address the concerns that are surrounding it. And this, in my view, can be done through a strategy, which I try to outline, which has three building blocks. A series of initiatives to build a stronger single market. A series of initiatives, crucial, neglected so far, about building consensus on a stronger single market. And then a set of initiatives on delivering, concretely, a stronger single market. Um, because one could uh, also consider that there might be a more inertial or defensive policy to follow in the next few years. There will be, even uh, particularly if one looks at electoral patterns in many countries, there will be a continuing temptation of a resumption of economic nationalism which will pose serious problems in terms of enforcement of the rules to the Commission. One could say, OK, try to do enforcement as well as you can, avoid harsh confrontations with member states, and avoid from putting on the table bold new initiatives like a real single market for digital Europe or for a real liberalization in the area of uh, of uh, services. As I happen to believe that these things are essential for Europe's growth and competitiveness, I prefer to 
uh, consider a more proactive option of being bold and forward-looking in the construction of what remains to be constructed of the single market and in the even more vigorous than it has been the case recently enforcement of existing rules but has, that has, in my view, to be accompanied by a number of focused measures uh, to make the single market more widely accepted. And I think that uh, countries like uh, Ireland or the UK, which I, I believe remain strong supporters of uh, markets and of openness, will have to make... Uh, uh, a bit of, a, of, of an effort uh, of introspection into the others. Because uh, if one does not see to what extent uh, a market uh, you love and I love is challenged elsewhere, there will not be readiness to some compromises, which in my view will be essential to foster the single market in, in the future. For example, in the social area, uh, it's obvious that with the financial and then economic and fiscal and to some extent social crisis in many countries, the degree of attention in the political agenda for social issues is on the rise. In many countries, the issue of inequalities by income level by sector of origin of income, look at the crusade against financial services and banks, has come up very much on the agenda. Economic policies for the last 20 years uh, didn't speak anymore of distribution of income and wealth. Now it's up there. Uh, would I be in favor uh, to pursue European integration of having substantially more uh, community social policies in Europe, I would not be in favour. There I'm rather British. Uh, there are different tradition, tastes, preferences. That is not, is not really a topic for much uh, uh, community policies. But uh, there are uh, specific issues that need to be tackled. For example, some of you may have followed the dramas in the debates in many in some countries following uh, certain rulings of the European Court of Justice in the Viking case, the Laval case, the, the issue of, of posted workers. I think it's crucial to find a way out there. I, I have, uh, to prepare this report, I have invited to a joint consultation the heads of, the, of Business Europe and of the European Trade Union Confederation to see whether it's not possible to, to see some common ground. That is one aspect. But uh, also on, on, on the social, uh, um, uh, member states will have in the next few years to care more about uh, uh, compensating the temporary losers from the integration process. Otherwise, the number of those opposing it will multiply which is not in the interest of market supporters, and also to have some room of, room of maneuver about uh, income inequalities, etc. But many people are now uh, saying that the more market integration proceeds, if there isn't any coordination at all in the area of taxation, a rather sensitive topic, I believe, in this and other countries, then there is, year after year, a tax advantage for those whose degree of mobility across countries is higher so that they can pursue more favorable tax regimes, be it capital, be it companies. Who pays the bill ultimately? Those uh, who are less mobile, workers in particular, and low-skilled workers more in particular. And we see statistically a growing overall tax pressure on those <laughs> and a declining tax pressure on the more mobile. Now, uh, 
if we want to promote the single market, we should, in my view, not superimpose heavy harmonized social policies, but at least uh, target those cases in which the working of market integration has inadvertently a byproduct which is seen by many to be social unfriendly, because that creates enemies to market integration. Hence, the idea uh, that you will find in my report that I have discussed uh, with finance ministers of virtually all member states of uh, not pursuing tax harmonization. Uh, I know that some words are taboo, uh, as was the case with industrial policy before industrial activism came at the forefront recently uh, of all places in the UK. But uh, uh, let's respect the national tax sovereignty of member states. Finance ministers believe they have this tax sovereignty. Of course, they are losing it day after day to the marketplace, but they believe, they like to believe that they have it. Let's genuflect in front of them. But, but, and you remember when finance ministers and central bank governors were convinced that they enjoyed monetary sovereignty. And their monetary sovereignty was a space of five minutes because technology was slow. Today it would be five seconds. On Thursday's afternoon, after the spokesperson of the German Bundesbank had stated the level of the interest rate, they had about five minutes of exercise of sovereignty because afterwards they, should, they had immediately to align to the Bundesbank rate, otherwise they would lose uh, capital. Market integration in a non-coordinated exercise of a pretended sovereignty. For taxation, it's slower, but it's not entirely different. But let's assume that there is tax sovereignty. Let's uh, simply find ways in which working together, finance ministers can protect better what remains of their national tax sovereignty. And, uh, and there, what I propose is a, is a vehicle, is uh, the setting up of something that was there for a few years uh, in the late 90s, uh, a, a tax policy group composed uh, not of uh, heads of tax administrations, but of personal representatives of finance ministers, so people enjoying the confidence of the minister and uh, able to see the spectrum of political topics that should work, chaired by the Commissioner for Taxation, to develop an agenda of discussion, of cooperation, uh, without, uh, uh, without seeking uh, harmonization and without attacking national tax uh, sovereignty. And I believe that there is uh, a lot to do there. There are other measures that I propose, but I think uh, uh, you may have uh, uh, perceived at that point what is my logic. I don't know whether it will be shared by the President or the Commission. I've done this work with his support, but in total autonomy. Uh, my logic, which is uh, to, um, to build a future for the single market, uh, leaning against the wind this time, uh, through a number of measured concessions in specific surrounding areas. And very last remark, the topic of the day is of course Greece, and I haven't pronounced the name of that wonderful country once today. But all this is terribly related to Greece. Uh, the Greek problem is one of deficit and debt spilling over to the financial markets. But that is largely due to an economy which doesn't grow enough, which is not competitive enough, and which therefore piles up uh, increases in the deficit to GDP ratio. But that economy is largely a web of rent seekers and of corporatists in the public and private sector. 
And that economy, if you look at the figures concerning the compliance with the single market and competition rules, is one of those who are more backwards in having let uh, the pressures of the single market and of competition stimulate competitiveness and productivity in their economy. And now people are beginning to realize that there may be one part of the solution to the Greek problem over the years will be these reforms. But, but your country, my country, many others, 14 others actually, are members of the Eurozone. It's lamentable, but unfortunately true, that on average, member states belonging to the Eurozone are more single market offenders, less competition compliant, than several countries which have not made the choice of the Euro, but have more uh, market instinct, like the UK, Denmark, Sweden, or the new member states, which may wish to join the euro, but are not yet there. Now, the euro was meant to be the cherry on the cake of the single market. The cherry is there, works rather well, in spite of some tensions, but the cake uh, is not a well-done cake. It's very heterogeneous. Economists uh, will tell us uh, that uh, to have an optimum currency union, you have to have a fully integrated and flexible with a high degree of mobility single market. So in the Eurozone, we should observe a higher embracement and compliance with the single market than in the other countries. But it is the other way around. So uh, in my proposals, and this is for the Commission, but also for the Council, and. I've had several discussions with President Van Rompuy to this effect in this newly emerging notion of economic government for the European Union, the single market, which by definition is at 27, should be a topic for greater political focus at 27, and the 16, or a large number of them, members of the Eurozone, um, should do their homework uh, better on this archaic a piece, but fundamental piece of the, of the European construction uh, to which uh, I would like uh, uh, to secure with many others a decent future. Thank you very much for your attention.